after I'm done being MVP for a while. All right, Ralph, if you could just watch and make sure that that goes live, yeah. I think we're good to go. And then I'll keep an eye over here just in case any of the questions come in. You're going. We're looking good. Okay. Mike Schreiner is my guest. I'm Jim Fan and Mike, thanks for the time. I really my appreciate pleasure, it. My pleasure, Jim. Coming always, from the Vineland, uh, what do you expect? Vineland Research Innovation Center. Right. Yeah, we so just did how was your trip and how'd that make, how'd you make out there? You know, the Vineland Research Innovation is an amazing place. Uh, I've seen it grow over the last 10 years. My involvement prior to being in politics was about promoting local Ontario food and farmers. So we did a lot of work at the Vineland Center and I can't believe how much it's grown in the last 10 years. Oh, and yeah. My compliments to the to the crew there and Jim Brandel, the director. But I was really impressed with two things in particular is, is they're doing research in greenhouse production and how it's all done through biological controls. So no pesticides, no chemicals, all natural, uh, all natural pest control. I was very impressed with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and doing a big focus on uh, getting Ontario product to market in ways that uh, consumers want and flavor profile and growing practices. And then they also had a very interesting uh, work on robotics and particularly in areas that are very highly labor intensive and maybe not the kind of work most people want to do and using robotics to help farmers uh, lower their cost of production and be more competitive. That's going to be a huge concern for the Green Party. I mean, the labor force, right? So you think robotics are coming in. I mean, we've been talking about this for decades, but it seems mm -hmm. like now, I mean, you see them jump, walking, opening doors. You see That's the right. videos of yeah. these uh, Boston, who is that, the guys in the States? That's right. Boston Robotics, is it? Mm-hmm. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, obviously you got some concerns around how it might affect the labor market. Oh, absolutely. But you know what? The Green Party's for many years has been calling for a basic income guarantee, primarily focused at, at that being uh, around poverty elimination. So, you know, let's provide every uh, Ontarian with the opportunity to meet their basic needs and mm. set a floor that nobody can go below, which would be the low income cutoff level. And I think that's an issue that's gaining more and more traction, partly because people want to see social justice and people are concerned about rising levels of economic inequality but also people are increasingly concerned about, you know, automation of jobs and what the effect that's already had on mm -hmm. our economy and our workforce sure. and what it could have on our economy and workforce. And so I think it's important for all of us if we're going to create caring, livable communities to make sure we take care of everyone. So what do you see the immediate benefit being? It's just that the, I mean, you know, the prices aren't going to come down. Is it just a matter of our prices won't go up as much? As quickly, or well, I mean, because yeah, you think mentioned earlier about the the yeah. labor portion of, for the farmers is yeah. it's a huge part of the yeah. Product. Well, I, I think automation is partially you know companies are automating to drive down costs, right, and uh, to do things more efficiently, and so I can see benefits to that absolutely, but we can't uh, allow that to create the rising levels of inequality we're seeing in our society. I mean, that creates social dislocation, economic, mm. and political um, instability. And so I think it's in everyone's interest uh, in Ontario and across Canada and across the world to ensure that there's a floor that nobody goes below. And I think it's time for a basic income guarantee. Uh, and I think it also has other side benefits. So it frees up more people to participate in the caring economy, for people to volunteer and be more active in building and fostering livable cities creates opportunities for people to go back and, you know, get ed additional education and skills upgrades. And it also supports entrepreneurs. Um, you know, to be an entrepreneur is, you know, both of us have been entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. Jim. Uh, you know, you need basic economic security if you're going to take risks and start your own business. And so there's multiple benefits, multiple wins for society. And not to mention the fact that it reduces um, health care costs, uh, costs in the criminal justice system, um, et cetera. Um, more people have more money to spend in the local economy, supporting local businesses. So there's multiple benefits to a basic income guarantee. Mike Schreiner is my guest. He's the leader of the Green Party of Ontario. What's, uh, have you got three key planks or five key? I mean, it seems to be the politics, especially, I don't know, maybe it's the conservatives. Maybe everyone subscribes to this uh, tactic, but it seems like if you, if you, you have to have a significant platform, but if you mm -hmm. don't have three points that you're hammering, hammering, hammering all the, or five points as it were, you mm -hmm. know, it, is that, are you taking that style this time around? So Jim, right now we're on a Green Vision tour. Now, uh, did you borrow that from the feds? <laughs> no, no, no. I think they call theirs like Vision, vision Green. Vision Green. Oh, similar. Like a green vision, green vision Tour. I like that when they this use mine. Ontario. Mine there was looking go. forward. I looking think forward. all the green stuff should be looking forward. It and, all you know, is. We definitely. I didn't get credit forward. for that, but that was. Okay, we'll get credit for that, Jim. 
so we're on a Green Vision tour, right. 2,500 kilometers, 20 cities in nine days. Oh. So pretty intense. Lots I, of fast food. Uh, you know what? No fast food, <laughs> believe it or not. The one thing I love about Greens, all of our stops have been at local family-run independent businesses serving amazing food. Like mm. we've been to places all over the province uh, or well through southwestern Ontario and down into the Niagara region now. But uh, I think we've done, I think I've done 15 interviews in two days. I think yeah, it's my yeah, sixth one today. Wow. So that's 21 in uh, three days. Good for you, man. And you know what? I think part of it is is people in Ontario, they want a new voice. They want a new way of doing politics. They want some fresh ideas. Because people are so tired like of the political style right status quo. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, back to the key platform. Yeah, yeah. So, our, so if you if people go to gpo.ca backslash vision, um, you'll see our vision book, which is a broad range of policies in a wide range of areas, offering solutions that put people first around centered around three key uh, areas, jobs, people, planet. Right, and so yeah. we want to create the jobs of the 21st century. Let's leap into the future now. I know a lot of people are concerned about uh, the economy, particularly around the fact that we've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs over the last decade. And how are we going to rebuild that middle class? And we believe the best way to do that is through the building the green middle class, uh, investing in, in the clean economy, clean technology, advanced manufacturing, um, caring professions. And if you think about it right now, 274,000 Canadians work in the clean energy sector with an average salary of $92,000. That's more people than work in the oil sands, as an example. So that's where we need to be investing in the economy of the future, not the economy of the past. How concerned are you that uh, your major planks and some of your policies are getting scooped up by the, the other parties? And, and more importantly, I guess you want the governing parties to pick up your stuff because, I, I mean, I saw a, in some of your writings, you know, you're not expecting to form government. Uh, you are expecting to be elected in your own writing, so I, I know that you're putting a heavy emphasis on Mike Schreiner being elected, and then we'll take mm -hmm. it from there as far as the rest of the Greens go. But how do you balance and how do you uh, kind of counter, you know, the Rob Fords coming out and saying, hey, no uh, provincial tax under 30 Gs or something like that, which is, I yeah. think, a great idea. Thank God. I mean, that was actually an idea the Green Party put out. Exactly. Nobody, nobody you, you shouldn't be taxed on earnings. That um, up until at least poverty level, and some of the most yeah. progressive thinkers but, of our day have been fiscally conservative and 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 bought into a guaranteed annual income or what do you call it now? Basic income guarantee. Mm -hmm. So I think what what I'm hearing is that people are tired of the establishment party that is in power right now and hasn't has lost people's trust in terms of how they're governing the province. At the same time, they don't want to replace it with another establishment party that has shown over the last two months it can't even govern itself little in the province so people want something new and different they want to see politics done differently and elected greens are showing that the fact that there are now three green mlas in british columbia holding the balance of power ensuring that the you know the through a minority government that the ndp actually holds to their promises the fact that in prince edward island there's now two green mlas greens are polling number one in the island and what that is showing people is is that when you elect greens they make a difference, they govern effectively, they put people first, they do politics differently, and people want to elect more Greens. And so we think that Green Way is going to hit Ontario on June 7th, mm. and we're going to elect our first Green MPPs to Queen's Park. Man, I hope you're right. It would sure, it would sure be a breath of fresh air, if you pardon the obvious pun. But uh, um, It would be. And you know what, Jim, just to be clear, I don't mind other parties taking our ideas. Uh, we Because... What drives Greens to be involved in politics isn't power, it isn't prestige, it isn't ego, it isn't mm -hmm. self-interest. It's about how do we make our, our communities better, how do we make Ontario better, how do we make the world better. And if another party takes one of our ideas and runs with it, which they do all the time, we're more than happy to do that. And you know, I like to say to people, a lot of what the Green Party was talking about 10 years ago is actually starting to be implemented now by the establishment parties. So if you don't want to have to wait 10 years to actually have the future you want, start voting green right now. You can have that future today. You're on script, man. I love it. You're <laughs> polished. I love it. Uh, Mike Schreiner is my guest, obviously. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can chime in with some questions. Um, Mike, uh, tell me about the Democratic plank. 
uh, because yeah. you know when I ran, and you know I've got a history with the, your party and the and the GPC. I ran first in 1993. Man, I didn't know anything about anything in politics. I was green as green could be, and that's you know Vesna was kind of helping recruit people. Mm -hmm. That's when Mulroney said, you know, run 50 candidates nationally or your party's uh, dissolved and we'll take all the assets. Not that we had any assets, but we didn't want the party to be deregistered. Mm -hmm. And that's what Mulroney's thing was. So I guess I was part of the, and actually went to one debate. Didn't know that when you were that nervous, your <laughs> vocal cords stretched so tight that you had no voice. Yeah, I did that on See How <laughs> really? Radio my first time in 93 and swore it would never happen again. It never has. I went to Toastmasters and got trained. But... Um, the democratic plank is so, mm. was so important to me, uh, as a green, or it doesn't matter what political stripe of people I'm talking to, I'm trying, I'm trying to get out, like, even for the liberals and the conservatives that have taken, you know, I, I, I swear they're one party and they made up a deal way back when, Hey, listen, we'll call ourselves a different name, but we'll do the same thing to them because mm -hmm. the liberals are... Uh, you know, so yeah. far left now to, to counter the NDP, I think. And, mm -hmm. and the Conservatives seem to have come so far centrist yeah. to get rid of the Liberals. Now we've got Ford that's a different uh, idea now. But just the base, like nothing changes until you fix the system that's broken. Yeah. And the yeah. representations, I'm, I'm tired of false majorities of 30 yeah. some odd percent when 70% of the people vote against mm -hmm. the governing party. Mm -hmm. I wonder how far is that? I heard jobs. Yeah. People plan it, but like, yeah. how far down is that? Yeah. So, I want, I want yeah. PR, and electoral <laughs> reform, to be number one for the Greens. Well, you know, part of investing in people and putting people first is making our democracy work. And it's about how do we make our democracy stronger, not weaker. I want a stronger democracy, and one of the first steps in delivering that is to make sure every vote counts. It's exactly why we need to move to proportional representation. It's been a priority for the Greens, but. It's not so much, some people say, oh, well, of course you Greens want proportional representation because you would have more seats. And it benefits but you it's really about what's best for voters and what's best for our communities and our province. And I think it's wrong that if you're a conservative who lives in downtown Toronto in a writing that's been liberal forever, you feel like your vote doesn't count. Mm. You feel like, why even bother voting? And meanwhile, you know, voter turnout in the you know, 2011 election was actually below 50%. The last 2014 election was barely... A, above 50 percent and then you start getting situations where 38 percent of the people vote for one party and they get 100 percent of the power and can essentially act like an elected dictator and so that's not good for democracy so bringing in proportional representation i believe is essential to making every vote count whether you're a green voter or a liberal voter an ndp voter you vote for one of the more marginal parties but maybe more importantly you're somebody who's given up on the system and you'd like to start voting again and you want your vote to count but I think there's some other reforms that can happen as well, Jim. One of them is let's lower the voting age to 16. Let's get more young people involved in, in electoral politics. And as an example of how you know other parties take the Green Party's ideas, I was a part of a uh, debate with all four of the major party leaders just a few weeks ago at Ryerson. And you know I stated our policy around lowering the voting age to 16. All the major newspapers started writing editorials about, whoa, that makes sense. Let's lower the voting age 16. Like it was something new. Like it was something new. And three days after the debate, a MPP introduced a private member's bill saying let's lower the voting age to 16. So it may be the fastest turnaround time that another party has taken one of our ideas. But the, but the theory behind it is, is you know, the, we need young people involved in politics. Getting people to vote when they're 16 establishes that lifelong voting habit. And then the final point I'd like to make is just the centralization of power into the leader's office uh, has really, really deteriorated democracy and particularly parliamentary democracy. There's a whole host of reforms, um, starting with just reforming the way in which um, the leaders have so much power in determining like who asks questions, when they ask questions, what committee assignments are. And I know some of that's inside baseball, but we have to start... Um, creating a political culture where MPPs once again are the voice of their community, not the voice of their leader in their community. Mike, tell me about how you've been able to make a difference. And we've talked, you've been on the show before. Mm -hmm. I thank you very much for your generosity coming out to sessions on the river. We went Gord Miller, but you drove a thousand kilometers to be there. <laughs> and great fest. That was a great panel. In a hybrid, by the way. <laughs> a great day as well. But uh, you've had some su successes without being elected. Absolutely. How and what have you got done? You know, I think, so first of all, uh, prior to having a seat at Queen's Park, we've made a huge difference. We were the party that led the charge 
uh, and getting big money out of politics in 2016, passing legislation that would uh, eliminate corporate and union donations and lower donation limits. Uh, we led the charge in saving funding for the Experimental Lakes area, the world-renowned Freshwater Research Center in Northern Ontario. Um, we led the charge in helping protect local food supplies by uh, banning neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, they're mm. killing off bees. Those are just three of many issues where we've led the charge. And how we've been able to do that is to not treat people like tax, just, just as taxpayers, like some politicians want to do, but actually engage people as citizens and engage and mobilize people in the political system through letter writing campaigns, petition campaigns, media campaigns, to put pressure on Queen's Park to act on issues that people care deeply about. And so by, by you know, putting our resources into putting people first and being a strong voice for people on issues they care about, we've been able to push Queen's Park to take action on some important issues like getting big money out of politics. I know it's a huge win for everyone, I think, in uh, the long overdue. Absolutely, long yeah. Overdue. So I like to ask people, you know, imagine what it's going to be like when we elect that first Green MPP. Imagine how much we can get done with one, two, three Green MPPs at Queen's, Queen's Park, mm -hmm. given how much we've accomplished uh, prior to having a seat at Queen's Park. Mike Schreiner is my guest. Mike, uh, I saw you nominated a candidate in Niagara West Glamborough. That's right. She's yes. 18 years old. Yeah. And that's great. I'd love to see youth engaged. And mm -hmm. uh, I was engaged pretty young as well, as far as getting uh, my name on the ballot. Yeah. Uh, locally here uh, in the region. Yeah. Oh, man, you, you must see what's going on. It, it's, it's, it's a mess. Yes. Yeah. I think they're getting nothing done. We've talked about democratic issues, about integrity commissioners, about complaints against mm -hmm. them. It, no work's getting done, mm -hmm. and I really think that the quality of candidate is key here. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these people see this $18,000 that they're getting out of the region is, is like a paycheck. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and many of them aren't passionate about politics, don't read all the reports and, and delve into attend the committee meetings and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So how do you answer the question, you know, the Greens have always had this problem because, mm -hmm. well, I mean, you know, <laughs> It hasn't been easy to recruit the star candidate. Mm -hmm. They seem mm -hmm. to go to the big parties. So mm -hmm. how do you balance the fact that, yeah, you're young and you're completely green and inexperienced and, and balance that with, you know, bringing in some fresh ideas and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you answer the question that, yeah. you know, uh, we need to attract a, a better quality candidate? Well, first of all, we're incredibly excited by the quality of candidates we're attracting. We'll be running a full slate of candidates across the province. Uh, and we're on target to have our full slate in place. We've also set a goal for ourselves to have 50% of our candidates be women. So we'd like to see more women in politics. We're on goal to hit that target. And we've set a target for 10% of our candidates to be young candidates like Jessica, because we want to have more um, young candidates involved, more young people involved in politics. I think it's going to be interesting because she's in um, uh, Sam Osterhoff's riding. So you're going to oh, have okay. two very young, young candidates competing against each other. And I think it's fantastic. Um, but we have candidates of all ages. You know, we have Karen Frazier at Niagara Center, who, you know, is a longtime community activist. Colin Reese right here in St. Catharines. Joe Diaz in, in Niagara uh, as well. And so um, we're excited about the quality of candidates across the province. Uh, we think there's a number of ridings where we have an opportunity to win. And so it, with our number one goal being elect the leader in Guelph, because we want to establish that base like this happened in new brunswick with the election of their leader pei with the election of the green leader and bc with the election of the green leader that then led to other greens being elected in the following elections and so our goal here is to elect one two maybe three green mpps but uh run strong campaigns across the province to set the foundation up for us to expand our caucus in the next election as well okay so this is your fourth election Third is leader. Third is leader, that's right. Yep. Second time in Guelph. Yes. The last time we spoke, mm -hmm. I mean, the Green Party of Canada hasn't had a leadership conversation since mm -hmm. I ran in 2006 with yeah. Elizabeth May yeah. and David Chernichenko. That's right. Did run. I remember that. And uh, come on, that's not democracy. <laughs> and you told me when I put the mm -hmm. question to you last time, if I don't win this time, I'm stepping down as leader. You still hold to that? Yeah, I think for me, um, right now, I'm, Jim, I'm just totally focused on June 7th. Oh, bye. I have 78 Dodge days. I have seven, no, 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 I have 78 <laughs> days. I have 78 days. Um, I hope you win. I, I mean, no, absolutely. But you know what? I am constantly uh, cultivating leadership in the party. 
We have a big team, a fantastic shadow cabinet, uh, a number of people who could be leader of this party in addition to me. And so to me, that's laying the foundation. Those folks can be uh, not only strong MPPs, but also cabinet minister material if we ever would evolve to that level. And so I'm very excited about the, the, the breadth of quality in terms of candidates, uh, staff, volunteers, everybody involved in the party. Now you mentioned you, you have a goal, and I appreciate that, of 50% uh, women. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need more women in politics. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to stay away from stereotypes, but I mean, when I sat on the GPO executive, mm -hmm. we brought in gender parity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so sure, like, <laughs> your sexual identification versus competence. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get in that conversation mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you're not like, okay, no, we need a woman here, mm -hmm. even though we got a man that's more qualified. Mm -hmm. Like, how mm -hmm. do you balance that out? Well, I mean, what we've seen with the GPO's experience with gender parity is we have incredibly competent women and incredibly competent men uh, so, on our provincial executive and we're quite excited by that so what's the, I don't think it's an either or situation I think it's right. a both and situation well and if that's the case then then awesome but uh, why what, what do you bring in uh, like at the provincial mm -hmm. executive mm -hmm. why do you think it's important to have gender parity because you need all voices involved in politics and I think it's important not only have um, gender diversity you have racial and ethnic and religious diversity, have diversity of ages uh, and diversity of uh, regions. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who come from rural regions, people who come from urban regions, people who come from the north, come from the south, uh, all those different perspectives strengthen the party. Because Isn't there's that, a number of issues that people look at based on their different experiences in life. Mm, that's and that's how point. we create an inclusive, broad uh, platform that speaks to all Ontarians. And I'm very proud of the Green Party's approach at, at, to putting forward faces, voices, and ideas that will speak to everyone in Ontario. Uh, and I appreciate that. And, and there's a point, to, I like to think that I see both sides of everything, but mm -hmm. isn't that just Absolutely. more of reinforcing the old stereotype that we need women there because all women think the same and their experiences are different well, and we need that experience there? That's exactly why we have women of all backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, different parts of the province, different ages. Uh, because I think to, to make a stronger party and to be a stronger province, it's important to have people from a variety of life experiences uh, to be a part of the conversation. Mike Schreiner is my guest. And to Carol, yes, we will have better audio on an uploaded version later. We're just doing it on the Facebook live feed right now off the phone. So uh, we got a bunch of people that have come in here, but uh, Carol was just saying the audio is not good. You need a lapel, uh, Mike. So yeah, it, uh, <laughs> we have a better version. Uh, going up on the YouTube channel later. Uh, Mike, talk to me about how you climb this hill. I know you're about mm -hmm. a, a thousand boats at a third place last time in Guelph. This mm -hmm. is your second time uh, running in Guelph. I, I know, you know, we've talked about the idea that, you know, the GPC, the Green Party of Canada, is kind of they funneled all their resources into Elizabeth May's riding. And, and frankly, if she didn't win, mm -hmm the party would be broke and not have a, mm -hmm. an elected MP. So you said you're kind of doing that, but you're mm -hmm. not, you know, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket, mm -hmm. but you're a thousand votes at a first. You're two thousand, well, would you say you have to double your vote to actually win based on last time's numbers? Like those are some big hills. How do you think? Yeah, yeah. You, so what are your I'm chances of accomplishing that? I'm very confident. So first of all, we're putting resources into campaigns across the province, more resources in, in local campaigns than we ever have in the history of now, the party. Now, are you concentrating on, on ridings and candidates that you think can win? Oh, absolutely, but we're supporting all candidates. That makes sense. And, and the mean... party has more resources than it's ever had before. Like, our fundraising numbers are at record levels, our volunteer numbers, our membership really? numbers, everything's at record levels. We have more support for the party than we've ever had before. That's going to benefit candidates across the province. We're also being very honest with people. I believe deeply in honesty in politics. Yeah. We are targeting that was, It doesn't resources. always help you out at the ballot box when you're that honest with well, people. Well, you know what? I'm going to give you a story about that in a second. Let me answer this okay. question first. <laughs> so um, we are strategically targeting a few ridings where we feel we can break through. That's what our members have said they want us to do. Mm -hmm. Guelph is one of those ridings. I'm incredibly confident. And the reason I'm incredibly confident, we have an amazing team. We have hundreds of volunteers already out knocking on doors and campaigning and we're in an electoral situation where people are telling me you know what we've one establishment party we've lost confidence in and there's another establishment party that's shown it can't govern itself 
especially over the last couple of months. We want something new and different. And Mike, you've been working so hard for Guelph, uh, not only as a business person for many years in Guelph, but also as a politician in Guelph. And people want that green voice at Queen's Park, that strong voice for Guelph and for Ontario. I'm very confident. We know we have to work really hard. And that's the one thing that I you know, so deeply admire about Greens is the passion and the commitment, uh, the willingness to put in the hard work because we believe in what we stand for. I tell people all the time that you know, it would have been much easier for me to get elected running for another party. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I would much rather choose the right road than the easy road, and the right road is the green road. And so I'm, I'm very confident, Jim. And then you asked me something else. I told you I would get back to you, and now I forgot what it was. Honesty. <laughs> Honesty. Yeah, I want to tell you a story. The handlers about that. are paying more attention there than the host and the guest are. So you know, in the last election in Guelph, I was knocking on doors uh, in the south end of Guelph, and I was on a cul-de-sac, and I went up to a gentleman's. Um, he was sitting on his porch, and I'm like, I'm Mike Schreiner, you know, leader of the Green Party of Ontario. I'm running for Guelph, and he said, What's one of your best top issues? And I said, You know what? We're calling for all-day two-way go service to Guelph. And he's like, oh, all politicians are calling for that. So what makes you different than everyone else? I said, we would be honest with you about how we would pay for it. All the other ones think magic money and fairy dust is going to pay for it. We're actually going to tell you how we would pay for it. And he said, well, how would you do it? And I said, well, we'd have congestion charges to go into Toronto. We'd have commercial parking levies in Toronto in the GTA. And we'd have land value capture uh, revenue where they build transit stops. All of that, all the experts have told us, the many numerous expert panels, that would raise over $2 billion a year to help fund transit. That's how we would pay for it. And the guy said, I would never vote for you. Why would I vote for a party that's going to charge me to go to a Leafs game? And I said, I totally understand where you're coming from. And especially the dichotomy, too, between, yeah. you know, GTA is going to pay, pay, for, you know, yeah, pay taxes yeah. in GTA well, for Guelph. Let me tell you the story there, Jim. <laughs> so I said, and I said, I totally respect that, but I hope you respect the fact that I was honest with you. And if we don't vote for honest politicians, we're not going to have honest politics. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what, I can't support you. Have a nice day. Okay. So I knocked on all the doors, and I it was a little circle cul-de-sac. I finished the door across from him, and he said, hey, green guy, come back over here. And I was like, oh, jeez. Green now, guy, you're how, much, how much abuse can one guy take in any other day? But I respect voters, and I'm going to represent anyone, whether they vote for me or not. So I went back to talk to him, and he said, you know what? I want to sign, and I'm going to vote for you. And I'm like, really? I said, what changed your mind? He said, I still don't like the way you're going to pay for transit. But you're right. You had the courage to stand on my porch, the courage to be honest with me, and the courage to tell me how you would pay for something you believe in. And you know what? I believe you, and you're right. If we don't mm -hmm. vote for honest politicians, we're not going to have honest politics. And I think people are ready for that. When I talk about doing politics differently, one of the key components of that is just being honest with voters and telling them exactly what you would do and how you would pay for it. And I think that's the kind of honesty and integrity that people are hungry for in politics today. I appreciate that. And uh, I did go, I think I went to your website. You said the first priority is you getting elected. Yeah. Second, being a voice for all the people of Ontario. Third, being a good par parliamentarian, which I yeah. believe you would be. Absolutely. I mean, you've got a great reputation. And we've seen that you can do it from the outside, which is even more difficult than being elected. Absolutely. And and then the fourth is uh, build the Green Party of Ontario. But two, two of the three... Uh, well, there's four here, uh, mean that you need to get elected. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So what happens, what do you do should you not be elected this time around? And, and let's say you stay on as leader. For the you know, I'm not even going to think about that until June 8th. Right. I'll be honest. Like, enough, really, I mean, come on, Jim. It's less than 80 days to an election. I think people would be disappointed in me if I was thinking about anything other than how do we um, conduct this campaign and how do we give people in Ontario a hopeful vision of how we can create jobs that put people and planet first? That's mm -hmm. what people expect of me. That's what I'm going to deliver. Any of these other questions, let's, I'll come on on June 8th and we'll talk about them. How's that? Cool, man. I appreciate that. Um, we talked a little bit about the pendulum swinging. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, uh, I know, the Green Party's been pretty left of center for a, a long time. Fiscally conservative, mm -hmm. socially responsible, a little left-leaning. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I even believe... Um, you know, I don't believe everything I used to, uh, as I told you earlier, when, you know, mm -hmm. when I first ran when I was 24 years old, I don't believe those same things anymore. And, you know, uh, I, this word triggered, mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, some things just strike me differently. And, and, uh, 
your girl at the front at the the Brunsey office there, God bless her, Amy, sends me an email, you know, back where we we're going around about mm -hmm. the, the nomination. And I want you to talk about the local candidates mm -hmm. too. Um, and she signed her email with, um, there's many obstacles preventing women, women from entering mm -hmm. politics. And I'm like, bing, 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 mm -hmm. bing, bing. I'm like, point to one. Mm -hmm. Show me, tell me one policy, mm -hmm. one law, one you know, company that discriminates against women. I'm just like, I'm tired of women being the victims. They're not victims. They're beautiful. They're powerful. They're intelligent. And, you know, yes, there's sexism. Yes, there's discrimination. It's all wrong. It should be rooted out everywhere. But this idea that we're holding women down, I just, can you, can you give me an example of one place where we're actually keeping women from being successful or running for politics? I mean, the fees aren't different. They don't have to get more signatures. <laughs> they don't have to raise more money. Like really, like logistically, can you can you help me out with that? I'm not trying to be a dick here, pardon the <laughs> sexual reference, but you know, this is what I, I read this and I said to Amy, I said, well, like what? And she says, well, here's study, 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 study. I'm like, oh. No, so I want Jim, an example. Yeah, I want so, something concrete. So Jim, uh, Canadian politics, we women are so underrepresented in Ottawa and Queens Park compared to most other OECD countries around the world. Like, there are systemic barriers to women being involved in politics. And part of those barriers are the way in which politics is conducted. This sort of winner-take-all adversarial approach to politics. Um, the fact that, you know, men just jump right up and say, yes, I'll be the candidate. Oftentimes women who are even more qualified step back a little bit more and need a, some additional encouragement. And, and a lot of it's to remove the barriers. I think in this Me Too moment, you know, you know, think of some of the horror stories we're hearing about sexual misconduct, both in Ottawa and at Queen's Park. All those things create barriers to women participating in politics. And so we need to remove those barriers. And I actually think one of the things that would help remove those barriers is moving to proportional representation. Because when you have winner-take-all politics, you have winner-take-all politics and you have the adversarial politics that um, that we see in Canada. I mean, just spend some time on Twitter and look at all the animosity and misogyny and attacks that happen towards people. We have to start moving away from that. I think proportional representation would start helping us move I'd away from that, that because it would require political parties and political adversaries to cooperate. collaborate and cooperate with each other. So there are systemic changes we can make to the system uh, to make it more inviting for not only women but also for uh people new canadians people from visible minority groups indigenous people like we need more voices in canadian politics tell me about your local guys we talked a little bit about uh, niagara west you've got That's a right. young lady out there 18 yeah. years old Jessica first Jones. time she's able to vote she's voting for herself i hope absolutely uh, there's just nothing she's an amazing candidate nothing like, better I, than I, being able to tick yeah. the box beside <laughs> your name absolutely. and how many people can say they did not forget at 18 years old so absolutely. I, I hope she's got a, a bright future yeah, in politics That'd absolutely yeah, uh, Karen Frazier in Niagara Falls. Karen. I don't know the guy in St. Catharines. Colin. Uh, Colin Reese, he's been yeah. very active. Um, he came up and worked on my Guelph campaign back in 2014. What's he, is he at Brock? What's he, he do is for Brock. Yeah, yeah. Teacher? Yeah. He, um, uh, he, yes, yes. Uh, uh, and so he's he's amazing. Like, he's been very active in politics. Um, like I said, came up and worked on my Guelph campaign last time. And uh, he told me when he wanted to run for the nomination, he was like, Mike, I was so inspired campaigning in 2014. And I've done so much work helping other people run their campaigns, including your campaign. I'd like to be a candidate myself. And I was like, go for it, Colin. He's going to be a fantastic candidate. Um, Karen Frazier, of course, Joe Diaz, uh, Jessica Tillmans. Joe Diaz. Uh, well, in the Niagara Center. Niagara Center, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. good. I didn't think you had yeah. somebody because well, yeah, what's yeah. going on with Wellen? They're yeah. off all the list. You're going to yeah, this fireside chat. Yeah, no one's yeah. getting no love, man. Well, we're, we're gonna I'm get, an old we're, Wellen we're, boy. We're going to get our candidate at <laughs> Wellen as well, so we'll okay. be announcing soon. Why haven't they uh, umbrellaed under the Niagara Green? So it seems like all they're talking about is Niagara Center, or St. Catharines, Niagara, and Niagara West Vinebrook. I never see any pub for Wellen. Oh, you yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, I really appreciate your time, man. I know pleasure, time Jim. is time is tight, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where you're going tonight, uh, mm -hmm. what people can expect. Obviously, it's a free event. It's a meet and greet with uh, the three candidates. That's right. Is, uh, All the, the candidates, yeah. The uh, Niagara Center guy going to be there? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay, good. So there's going to be the main community center, Niagara Falls, 7 and 9. Uh, people can come out, ask me tough questions. We did a town hall in Guelph on Tuesday night. Uh, 
packed house. People ask tough questions. I want tough questions because I think people need honest answers from politicians. And, uh, and so that's what, I, that's what we want to do. We want to have this conversation. And uh, if folks in the Niagara region come out and talk to us, we want to talk with you about how we can do politics differently, how we can create jobs and put people on planet first. I want to give you one concrete example around that. And an issue that's very controversial right now is the minimum wage issue. You know, I feel yeah. like the premier is talk pitting, about yeah. you know pluses and mine, pros Absolutely. and cons. Like, so wow. the premier is pitting, pitting workers against family business owners, and the conservative establishment is saying you know workers don't deserve to earn above poverty level wages. And the Greens are saying let's do both. Let's increase the minimum wage so people who work full time don't live in poverty, and let's lower payroll taxes on small businesses so they can afford to pay, hire more people and pay those workers a higher wage. And so to me, that's po doing politics differently. You know, if the premier and the conservative leader want to use people's livelihoods as a wedge issue, which is what they're doing, I think that's wrong. Mm. Let's create solutions that work for local businesses and for workers and for our local economy and our communities. So you're elected, they give you a magic wand and you can change one thing. You have one policy that you can make happen right away. What is it? You know, what I'm hoping for, Jim, is that we have a minority government. And like what I hope we have perpetual minority governments forever. <laughs> but these majority governments with minority I don't support. Want, yeah, are, I don't want elected dictators anymore in Canada. At least so, I want to kiss first. <laughs> so one of the things I would love elected is dictators. in the Good same luck. way, in the same way um, the British Columbia, the BC Greens have collaborated with the uh, BC NDP and are bringing forward proportional representation. I think for me that's a key issue because then we can get out of this electoral mess we're in, these winner-take-all politics that isn't working for people. We can start having real democracy. We can have the legislature reflect the democratic wishes of the people of Ontario. And then I think a whole host of other policy solutions will flow from that. But let's start with uh, a very strong democracy that reflects the democratic wishes of this province. I think that's the right answer, Mike. And so, if that's the right answer, then shouldn't that be the answer to every question that you're asked as a candidate or as the leader? Like, everything goes back to changing the way we elect these turkeys, doesn't it? Like, well, it doesn't matter if it's tax, jobs, the environment. It all goes back to PR, doesn't it? Well, I think PR definitely plays a central role. But I also think people in Ontario want to know, you know, how are we going to create 21st century jobs? How are we going to support local economies? How are we going to invest in our communities and make sure everyone can afford a home? whether they've got access to good primary health care, or how are we going to address the mental health crisis that mm. we're facing in Ontario? Opioids. You know, how are we going to, Crazy. how are we going to uh, protect the people and places we love by actually taking concrete action to address climate change? And so our vision book addresses all of those issues and more because people in Ontario, I think are hungry for change. They're hungry for um, honesty around the kind of solutions that can address a wide range of problems, and we can show people how we can create jobs and put people on planet first. And so I think it's important to have that conversation. And that's exactly why I think Green should be part of the leaders debate as an example. And one of the things I'm really proud of is there is an organization that's started called FairDebates.ca, started by somebody who used to work for another political party actually, uh, who is engaged in getting support from people across the political spectrum to say we need fair debates because we need more voices in the debates to offer Great solutions point. for people. Do you know how many uh, parties are running in this provincial election? Oh, there would be a lot. 20, <laughs> there's there's like 21, I'm 21, pretty sure, registered parties. Absolutely. So, as uh, the Democratic Green, are yeah. you going to do anything to make sure that, I mean, we, we, <laughs> obviously I got a long history yeah. with the Greens, but... Uh, um, there was a time when the Greens weren't invited. That's right. And now... They're still not. <laughs> well, yeah, in some writings. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly, I think, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and whatnot mm -hmm. have done a pretty good job at inviting the That's Greens true. in. But then Absolutely. you've got the Communists. And they've got... That's right. You can't That's have right. them all... Well, yeah. maybe you can have them all there, but yeah. are you going to do anything yeah. to make sure that the smaller parties, like the parties that are just starting out that have, yeah. aren't even on the radar or yeah. get uh, their chance to stand so, at the lectern and, yeah, and give their policy. Yeah. So what we've been advocating for, which I think is, is a good compromise, is because I understand having 21 people on stage would make it That's unmanageable. Tough. So there are four parties that um, get enough votes to qualify for the per vote funding. So why not have a debate with those four parties 
and then have another debate with the rest of the parties to give other parties an opportunity. I think that's a manageable way to give everybody an opportunity to get their voice out there. And uh, so my, my encouragement would be, or the thing we would ask for, is that we should have Elections Ontario establish the debate criteria. So then it's done in a fair, open way and in a transparent way. Because the problem now is, is a lot of those decisions, whether it's at the provincial level or even at the local writing level, oftentimes happen with the three establishment parties uh, in a back room with the media determining or whoever the local level whoever's sponsoring the debate that should be opened up and elections ontario should run that in a fair democratic and transparent way i like mike take care jim right on 45 <laughs> minutes right okay mike uh join them consider uh, voting for the greens go to gpo.ca gpo.ca absolutely. Uh, if you want to see the platform it's called green vision uh mike's on a 20 stop tour that ends at the end of march um and uh, he's running in the Guelph riding. Uh, and for anyone that was on here, sorry we didn't get to any questions. I see a lot of people logging on and asking questions. We will upload a better version that sounds better um, later on YouTube. Catch them tonight at the McBain Center, mm -hmm. 7 o'clock. And just a meet and greet. All the candidates Absolutely. will be there, including yourself. So I will be there. Happy meet, to answer people's questions. Meet and greet the candidates. And meet Mike Schreiner, leader of the Green Party. I appreciate it, Mike. Thanks very much. Have a good day, Jim.